Hello, good evening. This is Eric Ranchard. I'm the president of the European Society of Medical Imaging Informatics. And today I'm very happy to be able to introduce you Jacob Visser. He's a radiologist working at the Erasmus Medical Center, the University Hospital in Rotterdam. And uh, he's a leader of the imaging IT um, in the radiology department. He's also active in value-based imaging activities in his department. I mean, in, de uh, deploying and implementing such activities. And he's also very active in the European Society of Radiology, mainly also in the field of uh, structured reporting. So uh, today, uh, Jacob will talk about value-based imaging. That means how can we add value to radiological services and what tools do we have for providing those services? Um, as a, for, um, there's a, a practical uh, information that I would like to give you. Um, do not hesitate to send us questions. If you look on your screen on the bottom, there's a, a button Q&A, and there you can type your questions. So uh, we will use those questions to uh, start the discussion after the lecture. Uh, of course, you can also use the chat button if, if that's easier. So feel free uh, to communicate your questions, and then uh, I will leave now the uh, uh, opportunity to Jacob to uh, give his presentation. Uh, well, Eric, thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And it's my pleasure and honor to share with you my thoughts on value-based imaging. And as you probably uh, may have noticed, our role or the role of the radiologist is currently being questioned. And it's more already more than two years ago that people asked, are radiologists becoming obsolete? Or will AI soon put radiologists out of a job and even people are saying please do not go into radiology so with all that kinds of statements we really need to prove that we add value to the patient and that we are adding value to the healthcare chain so let's give you some introduction um, talking about value-based imaging uh, necessarily implies that we also talk about value-based healthcare. And in 1999, a report was published, To Err is Human. And that report basically stated that in healthcare in the United States, approximately 100,000 Preventable, uh, preventable deaths are uh, in place. So every year, 100,000 people die because of medical errors. And that being said, that led, so this report led to an uh, amazing increase into defense, uh, to defensive healthcare in the United States, making that in 2003, up to 15.2% of the GDP was spent on healthcare. And that's a huge amount of money, even if you compare it with all other developed countries. And one of the reasons that it went up, that, it went, that, that this number went up, of course, was the, the defense of medicine. But another problem also was the pay for performance. So once a radiological or another examination was done, people or physicians would get paid based on the volume. So you can imagine there is an incentive for people to do more healthcare, to do more diagnostic procedures. So, and this was um, also observed by a guy who was called Michael Porter. And he wrote a book together with a, his colleague, uh, Ms. Tysberg, on redefining healthcare. And he also published a very important paper in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine that was published in 2010. Uh, and there he stated that we have to move from a volume-based healthcare system to a value-based healthcare system. So we should not be rewarded based on volume on what we do, but we rather should be reimbursed um, uh, the thing on how much we add for a particular patient. 
So how does, who, how does he define value? He defines it as health outcomes over costs. So that's the definition of what he calls patient value. So this implies that when you want to increase patient value, you either have to increase or improve health outcomes without rising costs or um, lowering costs without compromising health outcomes. In these two scenarios, um, people and patients will experience more value. So what does this mean for um, healthcare in general? So one of the themes that was always old also mentioned was the, the move from a more general approach in healthcare to a more individual approach, the so-called personalized medicine. And that was stated in different uh, white papers, in different important journals, that, really, that part of the value-based healthcare movement is also a more individualized um, approach for each patient. And diagnostics play, play an important role in that. So here we see a precision diagnosis as um, uh, mentioned in the white paper below on the Harvard Business Review the pillars that are very important and that definitely do contribute to patient value are to improve diagnostic accuracy and also to reduce unwarranted variations in diagnosis. So just to summarize so far, in 2006, Porter introduced his value-based healthcare concept and part of this healthcare con value-based healthcare concept is that we need to move to precision medicine. And an important thing uh, in getting there is getting to the right diagnosis. And getting to the right diagnosis, that of course, that of course needs radiology. So different societies in radiology um, thought about that. For example, the American College of Radiology introduced their program called Imaging 3.0. And that initiative is basically a roadmap for radiology practice to move from a volume-based practice to a value-based practice. And they defined different topics how a radiology can add value to the healthcare chain. So I'm repeating that once again, that's important to realize that it gives you tools how to add value. So in what ways, what specific things do you need to address in order to uh, obtain value for each individual patient? And the topics they uh, address, and I modified them a little bit also because of the European situation. The first thing is the imaging appropriateness. The second thing is dose monitoring. We, of course, do not want to, want to use too much dose um, in order to protect the patient as much as possible. And the third item is reporting, and I'll go into that into detail more detail later but also we need an efficient process we have a lot of very very expensive equipment in our ideology departments and we need to use it in a more in an efficient way and then fifthly the artificial intelligence wave that has come into place like well, a little more than two years ago it was all ai i it's an important movement that definitely will uh, contribute to adding value for a patient and also integrated diagnostics. As mentioned before, it's mentioned as a diagnostics being a very important pillar uh, in precision medicine. So therefore, um, it's important to integrate all the diagnostic information and radiology can play a very important role in that. So let's go to all these topics and discuss them briefly. First of all, the radiology imaging appropriateness. It's important to realize that um, a radiology examination is a joint responsibility of both the referring physician, so the physician that requests for a specific radiological exam, and the radiologist. So both 
have to agree on the most appropriate examination. And the challenge with this is to bring the right exam for the right patient at the right moment with the right clinical indication. So having said that, um, we of course have some tools available that allow us to do that. We know all the guidelines, but these guidelines differ and it's very hard to know them by heart. Um, and you know that's why it's absolutely helpful that there is tools available that help us in getting to the right examination. So the ESR eye guide is there in place. It's an, uh, an initiative by the European Society of Radiology that uh, allows us to get to the right and to the appropriate imaging examination and it gives also feedback to referrers. I made some, I made some nice screenshots for you just to show you how it looks. So this uh, basically is available for all members of the ESR, the European Society of Radiology. Uh, you just log in with your regular um, um, uh, log in and then you open the ESR eye guide uh, and then you come into these kind of screens where you easily can choose the patient age and also the patient sex. Then the system comes up with a whole bunch of uh, um, indications in which you can choose the most appropriate one. And once you've done that, um, it will give you a appropriateness ranking for the particular patient um, that's in place. So this, in this case, a 64-year-old female um, who has right lower quadrant pain, appendicitis, suspicious for appendicitis with some um, distortions in the blood. And it, then it comes up with, uh, please perform a CT abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast. So these kind of systems are available that are helpful uh, in getting to the right examination. But of course, this needs to be incorporated into the daily workflow as much as possible because otherwise uh, people are not gonna use it. So the second thing that we mentioned was dose monitoring. And we can collect all the data from the so-called DICOM structured dose reports um, to come to an optimization of the dose for each individual examination. We can use also diagnostic reference levels to compare if our um, uh, equipment is used in the most appropriate way. Uh, there is a CT dose notification and alarm values on the modalities that, uh, especially of course the CT, that gives you idea that you're using too much radiation. And of course you can use benchmarking. So I'll give an example from our own institution in which we are very closely monitoring all those CT protocols. And here you see the example of the pulmonary embolism CT. Um, what's basically happened here is that we, um, we plot the DLP, the dose length product, a milligree per milligree per centimeter for all different pulmonary embolism CTs that were done in a particular month. And then it turns out that we have an average of 318 milligree per centimeter, uh, whereas the dose reference level for this particular exam was 350. So you see some outliers also uh, um, on the top, going up to even 700 milligray per centimeter, uh, but on average, we do a better job than, um, than the dose reference level. And of course, if you do the, this uh, in a proactive way, you make sure that uh, people are not getting too much radiation. So, here you see another example of the, um, uh, the different examinations that are showed here. Uh, CT scan of the head, CT scan of the lung, CT scan of the, um, of the heart. It's in Dutch because it's a, an information a leaflet in our hospital showing that we basically do a good job. Here it says the streefwaarde, so that's the uh, the level of radiation 
that uh, should be at least there and we are doing better. You see here, for example, in the uh, coronary CT scan, uh, it should be at the maximum of 7.1 millisievert and we, here we have the 4.1 millisievert value, which is quite better than, um, than the maximum value that is allowed. So this way we also add value. We're making sure that people are not getting too much radiation and will not get harmed by our equipment tools. Then reporting. And reporting on itself is of course a different topic, but I think I should also um, um, present it in, in this, uh, during this lecture because it's an important part also of value-based imaging. Because if we really want to have impact on patient care, we must write clear and concise uh, reports so that the referring physician will get all the information that he or she needs. And also Kurt Langlatz, he made a very nice uh, book, The Radiology Report, in which he basically says that the report needs to be complete. It should allow us to apply also decision support. It should be there in a timely manner. Uh, we also should, of course, evaluate our reports um, because then we are doing a good job and making sure that we are really uh, adding value for each individual patient. So you just saw here the four different sub items of reporting. Let's have a look at them um, in more detail. So when you would like to have a complete report, um, you have to make sure that all the information needed is there. So here you, this is just from a few years ago when we started a report and wanted to report on a particular examination, we just get a blank field in which we basically can say anything we want. And here you see such an example, it's in Dutch, but it just make, makes clear that there is flat text, there is no data elements, nothing in there, it's just flat text that was produced. But then of course, we know that structured reporting um, definitely helps us in uh, doing, for example, a better uh, staging and a better surgical planning job. And it was also stated that structured reporting provided superior evaluation of pancreatic cancer. So by using structured reports, we definitely add value for a patient because there is more and more precise information uh, so that the referring physician can make better decisions. So how does this look like in our, um, uh, on our site, in our hospital? We defined different um, templates here with the input, of course, of both the radiologist involved, but also the referring physician. Because we have to realize that we have like two um, clients. It's the referring physician and, both, and the patient. But the referring physician is definitely someone who needs to say something about the uh, content of our reports. And that's how we came up with these uh, templates. These are just examples to show you that it allows the radiologist to give very specific information. So for example, here on rectal tumor, what's the location of the tumor? What's the distance between the anorectal um, uh, tumor and the tumor, the length of the tumor, um, and also the, the shortest distance between the tumor and the mesorectal fascia. So all relevant items that give the referring physician the information he or she needs uh, in order to make the right clinical decisions and to select the right and the most appropriate therapy. Here another example of an ultrasound of the shoulder. It all allows you to score the relevant items. So the next thing is, when you have structured reporting in place, then you also can use so-called decision support. And let's have a look at the ACR Tourette's classification. That's basically, it basically says there is different items you have to, um, to score. So for example, the composition, when you have a thyroid nodule, um, the echogenicity, shape, the margin, 
if there is uh, something to say about the foci. And if you do that on a structured way, then you will get some points. And based on that points, you see that you'll get either a one, two, three, four, or five classification. And that gives you also information what you should do, if you should follow it up or if you should perform an FNA. So if you use structured information as input, um, so-called decision support systems are able using the appropriate guidelines to come up with a relevant recommendation. And here you see how that works. You see those five items that were mentioned um, here. You see them back here. And you see when you just say it's all okay, on, all the way on the left, it comes up with a thyroid classification one. It's benign, no FNA is required. But if you change this and you say, no, this is the shape is taller than white, there is macro classification, this is ill defined, then the thyroid classification is changed to four. And it says, okay, if it's even larger than 1.5, then you should do an FNA. So if you have structured information in the report, it allows you to also use decision support tools. And those decision support tools will come up with recommendations, with structured recommendations, so that the referring physicians will be guided in the right way and always on the same way. And then the second thing, or then the, of course, very important, it's to report timely. So we need to make sure that when there, once there is an important finding, we need to communicate this with our referring physicians. So there is, in, in Dutch, it's uh, um, the guideline for critical findings. Here you see that it's in Dutch, but what it basically says is we distinguish between one, two, and three urgency levels. Urgency level one uh, requires you to get in touch with a referring physician within 60 minutes and level two, it's within six hours. And then level three, it's within six working days. Uh, just to make sure that if there is very important information in the reports, you should communicate actively with the referring physician to make sure that he or she will get notified. Uh, currently, we use, um, uh, we, we evaluate the guideline retrospectively. So what we do, we have an NLP pipeline that uh, searches through radiology reports and then it will pop up with a, uh, if there is a critical finding and then we compare that with the reporting, um, with the report that the radiologist made and we um, check whether there really was the communication that is required by the, just, just, uh, by the, re, by the guideline I just mentioned. But ideally, of course, you will have a notification during dictation. So for example, if you say there is a pneumothorax on the right side, that's what said, that's what here in the box, um, then, for example, it should give you an alert, uh, please be careful, this is an urgency level two um, that you should communicate with a referring physician. So there is a lot of techniques also that can be used to improve those kinds of things. And another part of the reporting is evaluation. Uh, when you want to make sure that you really deliver quality, of course, you have to check sometimes if you did a good job on the reporting. So what we are doing here at the Erasmus MC, we do have an, a peer review system that requires every radiologist to have a look uh, in the first 10 examinations um, he or she is reporting on, uh, they have to look back at the previous exam and then check whether they agree with the report or not. I know this is not a perfect um, uh, solution, but it's at least something that measures quantity. And this is how it ends up. These are some numbers that there is agreement. Um, a little less than 98%. And if you compare it with the literature, um, it's, you know, it's nice. And um, also um, other studies are reporting comparable um, uh, percentages, of course, if it is done in this way. And what I mentioned also is an efficient process. An efficient process is definitely part of delivering 
healthcare. And we are using an, our EMR, our RIS, our radiology information system is in the EMR. That's why I'm showing you this screen. And based on the data from the RIS, we made a so-called value-based imaging dashboard. And here we just see an example of the screen that all the most relevant um, items that are critical for the process in our department that are showed here. And of course, you can modify it when it gets orange, when it gets red, when it gets green. But the basic thing is that we uh, control our department by just showing the relevant um, key performance indicators to make sure that the most critical um, um, processes in our departments will go in the right way. And if you want to have a look at more detail, then you can come up easily with all kind of graphs saying oh, how long does an examination take or how long does it take that the report will be finalized or how long is the patient in a waiting rule. All that kinds of information is in that particular dashboard. Here you see another example um, of the use of the equipment um, usage in which it says, okay, uh, how many of the examinations are performed on a particular um, uh, room. And of course, it's very important to know what your clients, who your clients are. And here you see it's the orthopedics, the surgeons, the pulmonary physicians, the neurologists, oncologists, those are all very important um, clients um, for our radiology departments. And what you also can see in our dashboard is where do they come from, all those radiology examinations. So lots of it is outpatients, clinics, 70%, some 21% uh, is from our uh, inpatients and 9% from the emergency departments. So adding value, I briefly mentioned different topic, of topics, appropriateness of the examination, uh, but also, of course, the report and the efficient process and also artificial intelligence um, will give us some um, tools to improve patient value. And I will just briefly go over it uh, to make sure that, um, that, it, that the discussion also is being covered. So we could use, for example, the um, artificial intelligence or deep learning techniques to lower the dose of our PET and CT scans. Uh, that's only one application, but it's, you know, it's in a large number, 200 fold lower than usual. Another application of artificial intelligence may be that you can prioritize your examinations. So instead of just have a look at um, what examination uh, was done last, you should report up, uh, upon that and you are done. Uh, there is AI tools available now that will uh, detect specific findings and it can give you alerts that such a specific case is in your working list so that you can report um, on that case as fast as possible. Here you have also other tools. Viz AI is another um, example of AI that, uh, that allows you to, uh, you to screen the patient for the perfusion images and come up with the most appropriate treatments. But it is very important, and that was also, uh, I'm always saying to all those vendors, you must make sure that the AI tool adds value in your particular situation. So for example, in our case, uh, we have our tertiary care center uh, and also um, the neuro working list is usually empty. So it does not really uh, make sense to have a prioritization tool for our neuro CTs. This is just an example, but just to make sure um, and make clear that you have to check whether it's really worth the money to implement such an AI tool. Um, another example of AI is that it detects findings that's usually missed. So the, the example for that is Zebra. 
uh, where uh, they have an algorithm that detects vertebral fractures. And of course, this is a very an extreme example, but especially um, when there is a, a little smite osteoporotic vertebral fra fracture, they are usually not reported. And those patients who um, are highly uh, probable to have no treatment for the osteoporosis. Um, and therefore, are they at higher risk for, for fractures. Um, another example is uh, the context flow tool that allows you to just select a particular area in the image and then it will search in a database and it can, will come up with uh, eventually specific diagnosis. I know they are working on that. Uh, so that you can make the most appropriate diagnosis and that you also can compare this case with previous cases. And it also searches in the literature um, if this case is really what you what you think it is. So that's another application of artificial um, intelligence. Another uh, important example, of course, also is the radiomics um, stuff. We need to be aware that there is semantic features in, 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 in the picture in, in, on the image, but there is also computational features. So features we are not, we cannot detect by the human eye, but the computer can extract specific information that will uh, give um, uh, some more information to the uh, referring physician. So for example, here we have the colorectal liver metastasis. Uh, they have three different growth patterns um, and if you use radiomics techniques they will come up with a, an AUC area under the curve or about uh, 0.80 uh, with a specific growth, uh, growth pattern just based on the CT. So that definitely uh, helps you and will guide treatment. Another application of AI. And then, of course, adding value, you could also do that by integrating diagnostics. Um, we as radiologists look at the images and also the pathologist looks at images, uh, but it is definitely important that we also um, integrate our workflow for particular cases. So for example, uh, if you have a look at um, lung tumors, then the radiologist uh, classifies usually it as being benign or un un uncertain or malignant. Uh, the uh, pathologist uh, basically uh, comes up with a specific diagnosis. Uh, but nowadays, it, there is no specific feedback when the radiologist, for example, says it's malignant and the pathologist says, okay, this is a benign uh, tumor uh, no um, standardized feedback loop is there uh, in order to get those kind of, uh, to uh, detect those kind of discrepancies. So that also, um, if you are doing that, you uh, are definitely also adding value for the patient uh, because a discordance may be detected earlier by integrating those two workflows. And of course, at the end of the day, we can really add value if we integrate all the diagnostic pieces, laboratory medicine, but also um, um, radiology, pathology, uh, bringing all those pieces together and come up with one particular diagnosis. Uh, if we could do that, then the referring physicians would definitely be happy. So. I just give you some examples how we could provide value um, for the patient. But it's not only about um, how we provide value, how should we add value for the patient. We should also make sure that we measure it. And I'm referring here to a very nice paper of Sarwa in 2015. And he basically discusses the change from volume to value-based imaging. And he is giving us the whole process from the decision to image to the report and the results that are being communicated. 
And of course, you can measure and you can monitor this particular process. But those are all um, process metrics, not value metrics. So in order to make sure that we measure and quantify our value, we should make sure that we choose the relevant value metric. So let's give me an example from the paper. If you have a patient with abdominal pain, you can monitor if the access time is not too long, if the turnaround time of the, of the report is not too long, if the radiation dose is not too high. But those are just um, metrics of the process. If you really want to quantify the impact of imaging, we need to quantify, for example, the time to diagnosis or the prevention of complications by applying um, uh, radiological examinations. So that's how we should quantify and measure our value. So we have to make sure that we prove our imaging effectiveness on the clinical outcomes. And um, we need imaging specific outcomes because for example, mortality, is it always really imaging specific? It depends. Um, so we need to have a look at imaging specific outcome measures in order to make sure that we really quantify our impact. And currently, there is a lack of value evidence. So most radiology uh, studies are reporting on technical efficacy and diagnostic accuracy, like uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and that is probably because there is a constant innovation uh, and advancements in technology. So that once there is a uh, new technique in place, then we only study the technical efficacy and the diagnostic accuracy, and we were not able to uh, quantify the uh, ultimate impact on patient outcomes and uh, society, society. And the value is implicitly assumed and incorporated into standard care. So also, for example, with the new MR, you say, okay, this is a new MR, we should use it. But there is no proof that, that it is really better. And, and, and what I just mentioned, studies from a patient and society perspective are lacking. So how do we prove it? We have to make sure that to quantify our impact on patient outcomes. And here we see some very nice examples. Uh, in 2013, the um, influence of CT screening uh, in the lung in the lung screening trial that shows that the mortality was reduced by approximately 20%. Another example is the PETS CT surveillance versus neck dissection in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. And it shows that uh, there is a lot of uh, neck dissection or of lymph node dissections uh, avoided when doing uh, PET surveillance. And another example is the uh, from the Scott Hart investigators showing that the usage of a coronary CTA um, lowers the five-year risk of a myocardial infarction. So then you really see the added value of the radiological examination. So what about future developments? It's important to link uh, the innovations of imaging specific outcome measures to radiomics, to artificial intelligence, and to integrated diagnostics. Because in that way, we will be able to guide all those particular innovations and make sure that they really improve patient outcomes and do influence and do um, uh, satisfy society. So to conclude, we have several options to add value in imaging. For example, imaging appropriateness. We could talk about the report, integrated diagnostic artificial intelligence, but there is definitely a need for valuation of imaging. And the value is reflected in outcome metrics. So for example, the mortality or the number of complications that is being avoided using radiology. 
and it's not reflected in the process metrics. Although it is important to make sure that you do not have a large, uh, long turnaround times, it's not the value that the patient is experiencing. So therefore, we do need relevant outcomes that are imaging specific. And the innovations should be evaluated using the value-based approach. So just making sure that radiomics and AI and integrated diagnostics is, which are the main developments in radiology, that these are guided in a way that they add as much value for the patient as possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jacob, for this very, very interesting presentation. I think you addressed all the main issues very well. And um, well, at this moment, as far as I can see, there are no uh, questions from uh, the audience at this moment. So let me start with the first question then. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm uh, always wondering, we do have to integrate a lot of information and this will certainly increase in the future. Yes. Um, my problem is, or my question is, is the infrastructure in the hospitals prepared to do this? I mean, do we have a sufficient IT infrastructure and also maybe let's even say standardization of way to integrate information and exchange information? Isn't, isn't this also something we should take care of? Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric, uh, for this great question. Standardization is a very important uh, topic. And we do have, of course, some standardization in healthcare. So, for example, we use uh, HL7 uh, messages. Uh, we do have some uh, IHE profiles. But I think we can do a much better job. Uh, of course, we have DICOM, but also DICOM, it's a standard. It can be interpreted a little you know, different between users or among users, but we do need a further standardization. Um, and I'm especially uh, saying this with respect to data. Um, the infrastructure is in most hospitals, I think not there, but what I personally think is that you need a kind of data platform mm -hmm. that's uh, outside of the EMR, but integrates all the relevant data elements um, for example, for radiology, but also other information, clinical information and all other diagnostic and also therapeutic information. Mm -hmm. And if you are bringing that, if you are structuring that data, bringing that together in one environment, then you also can apply machine and deep learning techniques mm -hmm. uh, in order to approve uh, all different kinds of things for patients. Yeah, so then we talk about a rather, let's say, vendor neutral archive of infrastructure or a seamless integration, seamlessly integrating all the information and systems that are available in the hospital. Absolutely, that's one part. But also, I think there the societies uh, can uh, can come up with uh, some more standardization. So, for example, RATLAX. Yes. And uh, I'm also working on the common data elements. It's a joint initiative by the RSNA and the ACA, yeah, the ACR, right. uh, making sure that. Uh, people in the United States um, exactly mean the same as people do in Europe and all other different countries. Yeah, there's another question I would like to ask you um, because you know, I'm very, I'm quite interested in everything what's uh, related to artificial intelligence. But mm -hmm. uh, one question that's certainly coming back uh, every time is uh, the validation of the algorithms. And this is also what you have been explaining in your lecture. The, we have to show that there is value in using these applications. So my question to you is, how do you think radiologists should validate the algorithms? Because algorithms, that, algorithms and pack, uh, software solutions that are being sold now do have maybe FDA, FDA approval or CE mark, but is this sufficient to be sure that they, are, uh, that they can add value and that they can be trusted? Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good question, and it's and and what I also uh, mentioned it during my lecture. You have to make sure that um, the particular algorithm that you want to use adds value in your environment, and mm -hmm. this is also in line with, the, for example, the base concept, the base theorem, um, which says you have a prior probability, then you have a test and then you will come up with a posterior probability. Um, and relate to that, you have also the, uh, the, the positive and the negative predictive value, but that positive and negative predictive value highly depends on the prior or the 
probability or the prevalence of a specific disease. So it's very hard to, um, um, to just easily say, okay, we have an AI algorithm that uh, you can apply uh, in all hospitals. I think mm -hmm. you, before, and we are currently uh, working on it in our hospital, um, I think you need to um, um, make sure that a that an algorithm works in your environment and you can yes. do that by just i think select some representative cases for your and actually you need test uh, validation data a specific uh, set of neutral data that that can be applied to uh, to evaluate the accuracy absolutely but you also should make sure if even if there is a neutral data set that those data are representative for your situation yes. Absolutely. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So we also tested algorithms uh, that, you know, had specificity of only 40%, whereas in other uh, cohorts, they were up to like 90%. Um, yes. So it's validation is very, very important. Yes, I think so too. All right. So um, when I look at the uh, chat box, um, well, um, there's a question. Um, maybe, yes, Daniel, please, you can go ahead. Yeah, so Lucas has a question for uh, for uh, Jakob. Um, so the question is, uh, how would you envision data exchange platforms across various centers in Europe? Do you think it's feasible? So I think that's a very important topic, actually, that has been discussed during ECR. But what is your view as well? Yeah, so data exchange, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult topic. So... What I am, uh, and I was also have a discussion. Uh, we are building a research uh, suite here in the, at the Erasmus Medical Center, and that was also: do we have to move our uh, uh, data? But I think that we have to rather uh, keep our data, the data from the hospital, in our own environment, but that we have to move the algorithms to the data so that it can be um, validated. So you can dockerize them and then you can check them if they, um, if they work well. So I, coming back to the question, a data exchange platform, we probably uh, need a, an algorithm exchange platform um, that allows you to validate the relevant uh, and, uh, or the, the, the particular algorithm. But, but do you like, do you think that so, for the initial development of an algorithm, do you mm -hmm. think it's feasible to have large enough data sets in an institution and then move the algorithm? Or so how do we make sure that we have enough data to actually build an algorithm that we can then move? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. that's another question. The validation, uh, you can do it by you know, moving the algorithm to the data set. But um, when you want to um, develop an algorithm, you need representative data. Um, and it could be that um, that there will be a large data platform in Europe um, uh, that's that's in place uh, that can be used to develop algorithms. But I definitely do think that the governments and uh, politics should also shake a position, take a position in that, uh, in order to make sure that also access to such a uh, uh, platform is guaranteed for all um, um, AI vendors or people who want to develop algorithms. I think for research purposes in a, a platform that is, uh, let's say, cross crossing borders is feasible, but for clinical applications that might be different. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then there's another, like, I, I, I want to rephrase it as a question, but uh, there was a suggestion from Hilde Bosmans. So the, he suggested actually to involve the medical physicist in uh, help in running the validation studies. But like my question then would be maybe to rephrase that a bit. So do you like keep that in your like say medicine uh, domain, or do you have medical physicists, uh, f technical guys helping you with all uh, the developments in value-based imaging, but also of course in AI? Yeah, so we, we do have both uh, here uh, at our department. So we do have medical physicists uh, and we also do have medical informatics guys who make sure, and, and those are, it's, it's a little different. So um, 
the medical physicists are really looking at if the, 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 the equipment is safe, are the algorithms really safe to use, and the informatics guy is more about the data, uh, how do we connect, how do we make sure that the um, algorithm works, how do we make sure that the results of the algorithms uh, are getting back to the workflow, the radiologist. So I think we both need the medical physicist as well as the metal, medical informatics guys together with a, uh, with a radiolo IT radiologist uh, to make sure that the validation and development process goes into, in the right way. Hmm. I have one more question, uh, Jacob, mm -hmm. um, regarding uh, measuring value. Yes. Do you measure value for, by, for example, um, uh, doing a survey among patients or maybe even among referring clinicians? Is this important for radiology department? Yeah, we do. We do that absolutely. Uh, we think patient satisfaction, as as uh, as well as referring physician satisfaction, those are you know those are our clients, uh, and it's very important to have their opinion about our services. But we also should make sure that we really quantify uh, our impact on you know, uh, for example, mortality or the complication rate. Um, uh, so those are two things that are both relevant and we do them both. Maybe a last question. Do you think the introduction of artificial intelligence will enable us radiologists to uh, profile us in a different way, maybe in a way where we can maybe even discuss more with our colleagues and um, in a team, in a multidisciplinary team, and maybe even with the patients? Yeah, so definitely, I, I definitely agree with uh, with that statement. So um, it's um, at the end of the day, currently probably not not really, but at the end of the day, artificial intelligence will save us save us some time. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, artificial intelligence will give us more information, uh, for example, by radiomics, um, and uh, artificial intelligence will also allow us to make a, for example, readable report. Um, uh, using structured reporting tools. So you can imagine that you, uh, with, with the right decision rules, uh, can make a, a referring physician version of the report and a patient version of the report. So all those uh, tools can be developed uh, more and more by using uh, new techniques, for example, artificial intelligence. Uh, and that definitely will, uh, um, will change the position uh, of us um, uh, even in uh, with 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 respect to the patient, but also with respect to the referring physician, so we can more communicate with the patient. We should do that. We should be visible for the patient. And on the other hand, we towards the uh, referring physician. I think it's important to take the lead in structuring data. Mm -hmm. If we yeah. make sure that we structure the data of radiology, and we have a kind of they, we, we create a kind of data platform. Uh, in which we integrate also information from the labs, then we are really a kind of diagnostic or a yeah, diagnostic physician um, who can partner and who can come uh, discuss with the, uh, with the referring physician. So I see great opportunities, but we need to be in the lead um, and we need to uh, make sure that we're not going to miss the boat. Yes, that's for sure. And uh in any way, if we have to integrate all this information, we will have to maybe even look for bigger screens or maybe totally different interfaces. But uh, okay, that's that's maybe uh, something to think about for the future. So sure. yeah, I think we can uh, conclude here. Uh, there are no more questions. And uh, so I would like to thank you very much for this very nice presentation and discussion. To um, uh, thank all, I would also like to thank all the attendees. And um, yes, maybe you can also, um, share the uh, message with your colleagues that uh, they can find this interesting webinar on the USOMI uh, platform. And uh, of course, we, will, we also have a program where you can uh, see what uh, webinars are following um, this year. And um, so uh, I would like to invite you to uh, come also to join us for the next webinar. And please do invite your colleagues and friends to uh, follow these webinars as well. So thank you very much again, and uh, hope to see you all soon again. Bye-bye. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you.